Now the pleasure to introduce the moderator of the first panel. Uh, Mary Louise uh, Kelly is a uh, uh, national security correspondent for NPR. You hear her every morning as I do. I'm sure I always look forward to uh, the interesting articles that she reports. She has spent uh, two decades going online, looking at her, her resume, traveling the world as a reporter for NPR and BBC. Her assignments have taken her from the grimy Belfast bars to the glittering ports of the Persian Gulf. I'm not sure which one I like best, but I think they both sound attractive, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, from mosques in Hamburg to the dusty deserts of Iraq. She's author of two terrific novels, which I didn't know and I'm going to research. Uh, and she's, uh, we know her from hosting Morning Edition on NPR on all kinds of issues. Russia, most recently, but also terrorism, spy agencies, rising nuclear powers. In short, she's the perfect person to be narrating, moderating uh, the conversation from this remarkable panel. And I will let her introduce her remarkable panel. We'll go for 90 minutes. There'll be an opportunity for your questions at, towards the end. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And please enjoy the entire day, as I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here. And I do indeed have a remarkable panel up here with me, so let's get to work. I'm going to introduce uh, the other four people up here with me and give you a sense of what we're going to do in this first session. I'll work my way right first. General John Allen, a four-star Marine Corps general, now retired, who I first encountered, John, when you were the top US and NATO commander in Afghanistan. And I should add, as of this month, you have taken over as commander, or president, as they say in civilian terms, at the Brookings Institution. So congratulations on that. Uh, next to you, Phil Gordon, who was the White House and National Security Council Middle East Coordinator under President Obama, now at the Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome. Nancy Limborg, who is president of the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, among the many past hats, you have worn uh, leadership roles at USAID, at Mercy Corps, where you were president, and U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, among many others. Welcome. Uh, and on the end down here, Juan Zarate, who was uh, in the Bush White House as his counterterrorism chief, uh, worked on terror financing at Treasury before that, now an advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and co-founder and chair of the Financial Integrity Network. Thank Welcome you. to all four of you. So one measure of how volatile and complex this region is, and hence our task this morning is, is that as I started thinking about preparing for this panel a couple of weeks ago, I thought we're definitely gonna lead with Raqqa, recapturing Raqqa. This is gonna be the defining incident that we'll all be focused on. And then by last week I was thinking, we're definitely gonna be leading with what the heck is going on in Riyadh and what the Crown Prince is up to there. And by the time this weekend rolled around, I was thinking, uh-uh, we're definitely going to need to lead with Lebanon and what the heck is up with the prime minister of Lebanon and where is he today? Um, and that is setting aside half a dozen other important and pivotal developments unfolding in this region as we speak. Um, all of which is to say, I'm going to throw it to the panel to let us know uh, where we should start. We will get to Iran. Uh, spoiler alert, we will get to Syria. We will get to the Middle East peace process writ large in the 90 minutes we have before us. Um, and I'm going to open the bidding by noting that not only is this a remarkable panel, but we have here gathered people with deep expertise in the military aspects of a region, the diplomatic aspects, uh, economic and sanctions. Uh, in play and then the role that international organizations and networks play. So what I'm going to do is let them start. I'm going to give you a minute each, guys. That's like a few sentences, but just to lay the groundwork of what to you are the biggest challenges, the biggest questions in the region. And General Allen, I'll give you the first word in a few sentences, quick summary of the many challenges from the military point of view. Well, Mary, Mary Louise, it's great to be with you. And let me just make a very quick comment. Um, in an era where we're wondering about truth in our society and this, this uh, advent of the post-truth theory of where we are today. Uh, I truly believe that NPR is one of the sources that we can, we can be fully confident in and I want to thank you for your contribution. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, it's been my pleasure, really, to be in and out of the Middle East for more than 25 years, and I don't think I've ever seen it as unstable as it is today. And to just to touch the key potential military flashpoints, which I think is where we are, and I'll sort of go from north to south. Uh, obviously, the referendum in, uh, in the KRG, the Kurdistan Regional Government, uh, is a potential flashpoint uh, of, of a variety of ways, and I won't go into the details now. We can talk about that. Uh, reconciliation between the Kurds and the Iraqis uh, with, in the aftermath of the recovery of much of Iraq. Uh, reconciliation be within Iraq of the Sunni elements and the Shia elements. As we continue to the south, uh, what's going on in Saudi Arabia, I think, has a number of us uh, scratching our heads. But I think uh, the young prince, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, may have violated one of the great strictures of great power politics, which is don't destabilize your base as you're attempting to engage in broad overseas adventures, which would be in Lebanon and in Yemen still. But also the other aspect of the region uh, is the four-party versus one-party standoff that we see in the Gulf. Uh, Bahrain, uh, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Egypt versus Qatar. Uh, that has, I think, permanently fractured uh, the GCC potentially. Uh, it has engaged Iran more deeply in the problems and has brought Turkey now back into uh, the region. And of course, we have the four civil wars that are underway that Wendy talked about, uh, any one of which is, has its own destabilizing quality to it. And of course, uh, underlying most of it is the continued Iranian destabilization uh, more broadly of the region from the western third of Afghanistan all the way across uh, through Lebanon uh, and some relationship still with Hamas uh, obviously pointed towards, uh, with Hezbollah, pointed towards Israel, our ally in the region. And then of, of course, beyond all of that, if, you, if that doesn't churn your stomach, um, the potential decertification of the, of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action by the President uh, with respect to Iran's compliance uh, with the negotiated outcome of that process. Uh, if we snap sanctions back on the Iranians, uh, we could find ourselves in another level of conflict that we've had before. And having been one of the military planners uh, to deal with Iran's nuclear program, um, that uh, isn't a particularly appealing prospect. And then finally, my, my last uh, gig, as they say, in government, which was the Islamic State, we're in a different place today than we were when we first confronted them in 14. Uh, but the Islamic State today, while it has been in many respects decimated in the physical sense in what we call core ISIL in Iraq and Syria, it, it became a three-headed monster a couple of years ago, which means the, the Daesh, as it's called, now has provincial holdings in many of the places around the Middle East, the periphery in Libya, in the Sinai, in uh, the Khorasan, which is uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, but it also has gone global. And it's a very effective global network, which is riding on the Internet of Things. So many challenges, um, and they all are related in some form or another, being able as an administration to figure out how they do, in fact, uh, relate. And they all sort of end or could begin in the Middle East peace process, which is one of the most important aspects of, of the service that I've ever had. They all have an interrelationship that uh, we should help the administration to try to figure out as they seek not to parcel out the, the different issues, but ultimately to find the common threads between them so that we can have a comprehensive Middle Eastern policy, which we lack right now. Thank you. Excellent starting point. Phil, let me let you pick up. How do U.S. diplomatic challenges and opportunities overlap with the military picture? Um, thanks, Mary Louise. Uh, nice to be here. Um, as you say, we face a bewildering number of diplomatic, military, and other challenges across the region. I think if you gave us all a test and we had 60 seconds to try to get them all in, John did about as well as possible, but at the end of it, we'd probably each say to ourselves, and you'd say to yourself, well, he didn't even mention X, Y, and Z because maybe unprecedented the number of hugely important things that we do face. So uh, rather than try to pass that test, I would make a comment about the region more broadly and where it fits into U.S. Uh, policy, which is to say that, you know, this panel, I guess, is about priorities and our, what we focus on will sort of indicate priorities. My basic point to kick off would be that the Middle East itself must be a priority. And I say that as somebody who I think has learned appropriate skepticism about uh, uh, how the United States 
uh, can deal with some of these challenges, some of which are literally impossible. And as someone who served in an administration who uh, proclaimed a goal of pivoting away from uh, the region, uh, partly because it was too difficult, but partly in some ways because people felt that we didn't have priority interests there. And I think that one thing that should be clear and should emerge from this discussion is that seems to me at least not really uh, an option. Um, we continue to have enormous uh, interests in all of the challenges that we are going to talk about. John mentioned a few, but in Iran, we're talking about nuclear proliferation. And if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, you can be certain that other countries in the region will uh, want to. That seems to me a remaining primary US interest. Uh, you look at the humanitarian piece, and we've seen in recent years hundreds of thousands of people uh, being killed and displaced, a million uh, refugees going into Germany alone, destabilizing European politics. Uh, I would argue that the stability of the European Union and, and Europe is a strong American interest, so that alone, even beyond the humanitarian. Also undermining neighbors, you know, the numbers of refugees in Turkey, uh, Iraq, Lebanon, which we'll get to another factor there. I don't think you can in any way suggest that that's not a major interest. Uh, and even energy, the old standard, which used to be the argument to a large degree for why we had uh, strategic interests in the Middle East, and then I think some have allowed themselves to conclude, well, that's not so true anymore. U.S. is relatively ind independent, so we can pivot away. Right. But that one, too, doesn't really uh, hold up. Uh, we, as, as the United States, might be relatively energy uh, independent, but the world isn't, and energy is fungible. And still, so long as Europe, India, East Asia rely on energy from the Middle East, we have a profound interest in stability there. So that's my broad overall uh, point. We'll get into priorities among those issues, but I think we have to understand that the region itself remains a profound U.S. strategic interest. Nancy, where would you pick up that thread, looking at this from the perspective of, I'll call it soft power, but from the perspective of the international organizations that you've worked with? Sure, thanks, Mary Louise, and uh, congratulations uh, for a wonderful event, uh, Wendy. Um, and that was quite a comprehensive laydown. Let me just add that, um, you know, we're really looking at the fruit of a number of decades of militarized proxy building within the region. And you've got the result of, of armed uh, militias and factions throughout the region, some of which are slipping out of control of their patrons and leaving in their wake thousands and thousands of mainly young men who are armed. Um, there's also the question of the many young mainly men, but some women who were pulled into various extremist groups. What is their future and where do they go? Um, 15 million refugees in the region um, who have been displaced by the four civil wars that we've all talked about. Um, and uh, the, the question is what happens to what is essentially the next generation of this region? Um, and an era where education has been disrupted for hundreds of thousands um, of uh, uh, displaced children and young adults. Um, and you continue to have women not fully ha uh, being able to be a part of, re of the rebuilding. So you've got profound social disruption uh, that needs to be thought about as you look at solution sets. And it's in a region which, uh, that a colleague of mine just reminded me recently, it's a region without regionalism. It's in fact, the Middle East was a term coined in, in the early 1900s by an American, and there isn't a platform for dialogue or cooperation or even an, a way to come together to, to address what are profound rifts within and between countries. And you see this increasing factionalism um, with Sunni leadership uh, as disrupted and as weakened as we've ever seen. So it creates additional, I think, requirements of support and leadership from third parties. And uh, looking at helping to rebuild um, not just the infrastructure, but and to just amplify what, what John said, really looking at how do you proceed with reconciliation at, at a very basic level uh, between all of the factions within Iraq, within Israel, within uh, among the Palestinians. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, a place that is so divided uh, that it affects the future for generations to come. 
And that's a great frame for our comments this morning, looking at this from a generational point of view. Juan, let me let you pick up. I don't know if you want to take on the economic challenges and opportunities or speak to the, the counterterrorism efforts underway and which are obviously affect the entire region. Thank you, Mary Louise. Let me, let me echo the thanks to MEI and, and Wendy for not just this conference, but for your consistent work on these important issues, especially now uh, in, in this period of great dislocation and adjustment, as General Allen noted. And I just want to note, my claim to fame is I was a classmate of Mary Louise's in college. So that's, that's my And I great have honor. some good stories, so see me after. <laughs> yeah. We're going to reunion this year, right? Yeah. Um, maybe I can do this. Let me just comment in 30 seconds, um, kind of the, the broad trends feeding off of what Nancy indicated that I think are important to understanding the dislocations and then talk about three particular things that I think are interesting from a counterterrorism and an economic perspective. Um, the first are the, are the demographics. I mean, this is a region where the majority of the population is under the age of 30. And that creates enormous amount of pressure as well as opportunity. Uh, challenges with respect to the lure of extremist groups, the disillusionment of societies that aren't providing economic or, or other opportunities, and what the future of the region demonstrates. And so a lot of the threads that you see throughout the, the, the sort of the catalog of challenges that General Allen laid out uh, revolve back down to this question of demographics. A question, secondly, of leadership and governance. What, what does that mean in a region that's undergoing a shockwave, not just of demographics, but of, of what actual governance means in the 21st century? Uh, we saw this in the context of the Arab revolutions. We're seeing this in the context of the civil wars. We're seeing this even in the context of what's happening in Saudi Arabia and in Lebanon. So this broader question of what does governance actually look like and finally, modernization. What does a modern Middle East actually look like and what, is it, what does it aspire to be, whether in the context of tribal societies or in the context of regional arrangements? What is the future of the GCC, for example, in the context of the, the rupture that has been described? So those are three overarching themes that are important to keep in mind because they thread throughout all the issues that, that we're gonna talk about. Three particular issues that I think are important from my perspective and, and given my background from a CT perspective and from the US Treasury. One is that the nature of the proxy battles that we've seen simmering for many years and that Nancy described are now sort of not only heating up but coming to the fore and are animating the counterterrorism problems in a very dramatic way. And so I think we're entering actually a new phase of counterterrorism challenge that moves beyond the challenges of Al Qaeda and ISIS and Daesh and begins to look at counterterrorism through the lens of the proxy battles that are emerging between the Iranian-led forces and proxies and Sunni Arab-supported uh, uh, proxies. Uh, and that begins to sh reshape how we think about the counterterrorism challenges in the region. And we can talk a bit more about that. So that's one. Second is we have shifting alliances in, in some fairly dramatic ways that I think are important. Uh, you obviously have the rupture among the GCC. Uh, you have an alignment between Israel and Sunni Arab states uh, in alignment against the Muslim Brotherhood, against Iran, uh, and, and in common uh, cause against other, other actors. Um, you have the question of what the U.S. role is uh, in this context. What, what does U.S. alliance with the Kurdish um, uh, forces that we've aligned with mean? What does the U.S. relationship with Turkey look like, given the changes in Turkey? So you have a, a sort of this dislocation and adjustment of alliances that I think are important to keep in mind in this environment. And third, and this, Mary Louise, goes to your question about economic power and to Phil's point mm. about uh, the role of energy, there's an interesting dimension of the use of economic power and influence in a more aggressive and overt way uh, in the region than ever before. Uh, in part, taking lessons from what the US did post 9-11 to put more centrally the use of economic and financial power at the center of national security as a way of isolating rogue actors or punishing uh, rogue behavior. Um, you now see that at play in terms of what's happening in the region, especially with the major economic and energy powers. And so you see in the debate with, uh, between Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Qatar, uh, a very fundamental question of how you think about sanctions and embargoes. Um, Turkey has entered this space a bit. Uh, you now have a question of how Saudi is treating Lebanon in terms of the use of economic power and influence, how the UAE is using its power. So there's a, there's a new dimension of the use of economic and, and energy power uh, 
uh, in a regional and even a global context, which I, which I think is different and interesting to talk about. Thank you. Okay. Thanks to all four of you for setting the stage. I'm going to drill down now on some of the, the topics that we've touched on in the opening remarks. And let me, I'm going to stay with you, Juan, and throw you a quick question on the news that many of us woke up to this morning, uh, which is the latest, what the heck is going on with the Prime Minister of Lebanon? Is he still the Prime Minister of Lebanon? Where is he? How long is he going to be in Riyadh? And is he there against his will? Um, the story is changing as we sit here hour by hour, but what does it tell us about the, you know, what is it revealing about the broader forces at work in yeah. the region? It's a great question, and I don't pretend to have any better insights than, than anybody else. I'm, I'm reading the media as it, as it uh, unfolds. Uh, but I do think it's, a, it's an interesting reflection of a lot of the dynamics that we've all talked about. First and foremost, it's a reflection of some of the internal dislocations and shifts within Lebanon. Right? There has been a sense that Hezbollah has been um, uh, on the upswing and greater, uh, more greatly empowered in recent years, politically, economically, and militarily uh, than certainly the Saudis and, um, and Western-aligned forces would like. Um, I think there was an assumption for many years that uh, Hezbollah's entry into the Syrian civil war would actually be their demise. And in many ways, it has not turned out to be the case, and in fact, quite the opposite. And I think the concern for Western forces, for the Saudis, for the Emiratis, and others who, who worry about Iranian influence is that not only has Hezbollah gained greater influence, but Iran is great, gaining an even greater foothold uh, on the Mediterranean as a result. Um, there's concern in Israel as well that uh, what you have is a Hezbollah that is not only politically empowered, but is more empowered by better weapons. Uh, with missiles that are, uh, are trained at uh, is Israeli cities, um, missiles that have been shipped to the Houthis and are now being used against Saudi Arabia. So this sense of growing military dread uh, around a conflict is there. Um, and then this sense in Saudi Arabia that um, they should begin to exert more influence around uh, what is in essence a proxy battle in Lebanon uh, and their attempt to actually machinate this, which you know, leads to this intrigue around, uh, was Prime Minister Hariri forced to resign? Is he being held hostage? Um, a really remarkable um, statement, if you, if you think about it, you know, a, a country holding another prime minister potentially hostage and dictating the terms of his governance of, a, of another sovereign state. It's a pretty dramatic statement if that's the case. And so I think it's what's unfolding as a sort sort of a telenovela novella, um, in the Middle East um, has very serious ramifications for the concerns about this proxy battle in the region, and how it is we think about governance in Lebanon. Uh, let me let John jump in here, pick up on this point of what this tells us about Saudi Arabia and what Crown Prince Mohammed is thinking and how he is exerting influence. Well, let me, let me uh, come back to what Juan said, and I'll, I'll mm -hmm. hit that in a moment. There, there's a couple of things. I, I do absolutely believe that we have uh, an issue of, uh, of an extension of uh, the use, by the use of proxies, uh, of larger power um, dynamics in the region. So we're, we're seeing that in the battle space in Syria. We're seeing that in, in other places as well. And I think Lebanon is, is an example of that. Uh, but I think we're going to still see the dynamic, and this goes to Nancy's point, of the use of proxies uh, to lead and conduct terrorism versus uh, our inability to both to understand and to articulate the regional strategy necessary to deal with the forces of radicalization, which are going to continue to radicalize tens of millions of young men and women uh, every year that have just no hope except ultimately be pushed into the arms of extremists and ultimately end up in these groups. So radicalization is a real issue that we're going to have to deal with, apart from the fact that they're wielding these groups as proxies once they're, they have metastasized into Al-Qaeda, Salafi jihadist organizations primarily. Um, with regard to Hezbollah, one of the things that uh, we should not discount is the fact that while they're well armed, they're also now highly experienced in the battle space. Entire battles were fought in Syria where the ground forces were either Hezbollah elements that were uh, supported by I Iranian, and we didn't, didn't mention Russia, 
uh, to this we'll point. Yeah, but, but Russian support to include Russian special forces advisors. Hezbollah, beyond being well armed, is now, I think, very well uh, groomed in the context of battlefield experience. They have taken casualties, they have fought well, and if you didn't like what happened in the Lebanon War in 06, you're not going to like what the next one looks like on the ground with respect to the challenges that Israel will face. Uh, you know, it's difficult to know exactly what's going through, shifting to Saudi Arabia, what's going through the mind of the young prince. Uh, lots of people are looking uh, to him uh, to fulfill at least his publicly stated uh, intentions, which is to begin a reform process in Saudi Arabia, which the state desperately needs. Uh, it really needs, and this goes to uh, Juan's point, it really needs to embrace the modernity uh, for, that, uh, for those people uh, in a manner that, that both in, uh, embraces modernity but also creates reforms within the society itself freeing it from some of the Wahhabi lock, which has, which has in many respects uh, frozen the society in, in ways that keep it out of sync with many of the societies around them. In particular, I'm thinking uh, Israel and uh, on the other side, the United Arab Emirates. So as he seeks uh, change, but he, he has also very aggressively uh, under the guise of an anti-corruption campaign, eliminated perhaps much of the opposition uh, ultimately to his ultimately uh, ascending into, uh, uh, ultimately ascending to be the king uh, in the event that his uh, father for any variety of reasons were to abdicate early or uh, were, to, uh, were to find it difficult to continue to, to lead. But he's, he's created this internal friction and this internal instability at the very moment that he is uh, finding it difficult to resolve the issues associated with the war in Yemen, uh, having led the process ultimately of confronting Qatar, which, it, which really has not resolved, I think, in any way that uh, either the Saudis or the Emiratis would have liked to see. Qatar seems to be capable of, uh, of holding on uh, and resisting. So w w what we're finding is we have internal dynamics in Saudi Arabia which are uncertain at the very same moment that we have a major war to the south that has been unresolved. We've created friction in the, in the Gulf, which has uh, had uh, negative consequences for the GCC, and now we're engaging uh, Iran in other places as well. Uh, that's a lot of dynamics for a very young leader in a country which, in the end, really has limited capabilities. And our concern, our, as we watch this unfold, is that one or more of the wheels is going to come off this car pretty quickly if we're not careful. Uh Phil, I want to let you follow quickly before we move on from Saudi Arabia. Are the wheels going to fall off this car? Well, they might. I, and I agree with John about the risk of taking on too much. Uh, two points, one on the Lebanon piece and then on, on reform. Because I think Lebanon, Juan and John took this in the right direction. The, the question isn't really what's going on in Lebanon. There are things going on in Lebanon. But it really is what is going on in Saudi Arabia. Because the prime minister of Lebanon didn't just up and decide one day, I, you know, I feel like resigning for domestic political reasons. Clearly, that everything that's going on on that front, which is what you asked about, is a function of what's going on on the Saudi front. Uh, and what seems to be going on, at a minimum, is that the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia uh, was not prepared to allow the Prime Minister to continue to be the face of what he considered to be a Hezbollah Iranian government. And so at a minimum, it seems to be a Saudi message that says, we're not going to allow that anymore, that, that you have this you know, legitimizing face that country is uh, run by Hezbollah, dominated by Iran, and we need to be clear about that. So at a minimum, I think it's that. The more open question is, what is the next step? Uh, is resignation what they're asking for, or is it more than that? And putting it in the context of the other crises that John mentioned, uh, there is a pattern here of Saudi Arabia defining a problem and then doing something about it. In Yemen, for years, they were saying, look, we're not going to tolerate Iran putting a Hezbollah on our border. And then they did something about it. We can debate the, the merits of what they did, but they went in. Uh, in Qatar, they said, we're not going to tolerate this government associating with Islamism, Muslim Brotherhood, and so on and so forth. Uh, they tried something in 2014, and then eventually the Crown Prince and others did something about it. So I think the question about Lebanon now, is it only the Prime Minister has to resign because I don't want to see his legitimization of Hezbollah, or, and you put it in the context of declaring the attempted Houthi missile strike on Riyadh as an act of war by Iran. I mean, the logic, if you follow those other things, is potential action could follow that. 
a great big watch this space hovering over a couple of key actors in the region, but let me pivot us to Middle East peace process writ large. Um, I don't know if y'all still get your newspapers delivered at home, but I do, and I woke up Sunday to the New York Times front page headline, Kushner-led team is forming an ultimate deal for Mideast. Uh, and we read that this is uh, the Trump administration forming, and I'm quoting, a concrete blueprint to end the decades-old conflict. Now, keep reading, and you will find quoted in this one Philip Gordon, who weighs in and tells us, uh, there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to Middle East peace. Even vague principles are beyond what the parties are willing to embrace. So, Phil, let me give you first word on this. Um, Color you skeptical, it sounds like. Yeah, I agree with that, actually. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you do. Uh, a brilliant observation. <laughs> brilliant. No, yeah. Exactly. That, that was a profound point, I think. Um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, John and I uh, had the opportunity to spend a lot of time on this issue uh, together, and I think uh, I'll go on a limb and say neither one of us is going to say um, it's easy. Uh, and I would even take the next step and say the conditions are probably even worse now than they were then. I mean, they were hard enough then, and we, notwithstanding, I don't think anyone can blame the United States for a lack of effort on that. Secretary Kerry devoted enormous energy to that problem. He's often criticized for putting too much time into that. John and his team devoted enormous energy to maybe the key to the situation, which was resolving Israeli security concerns, and maybe, John, you'll want to say a word about that. But notwithstanding all of that energy and effort, the reality was, and that's what I said in that piece, that fundamentally the sides were too far apart on fundamental uh, issues. You currently now have an Israeli cabinet, the majority of which doesn't even believe in a two-state solution, let alone being willing to sign on to uh, measures that would be domestically difficult to sell. Uh, and when you say conditions are worse now, is that what you mean, that domestically you're dealing with two leaders? I mean, on both sides. I mean, less if, power than they did five years ago? If you assess that uh, any peace plan, whether put forward by the United States or the parties, uh, needs to be accepted and sold on both sides, it seems to me the Israeli side is less willing to offer something that would meet the Palestinian bottom line, the conceivable bottom line, now than it was in 2014. And on the Palestinian side, uh, you have a government that uh, couldn't sell it to its people, doesn't have the legitimacy to sell it to its people, even if somehow, miraculously, President Trump uh, persuaded them to try it. Uh, Palestinian Authority is on the verge of a leadership transition. Uh, President Abbas is in, I think, the 13th year of his five-year term. Uh, he's 82 years old. He is not about to embrace the offer that is coming from this current uh, Israeli uh, government and somehow try to sell it. And the last point, Mary Louise, because I know that the administration has talked a lot about and many people speculate about what's different and the reason I'm wrong is that the Arabs are going to help this time. The so-called outside-in process where, okay, the parties won't agree, but now that the Gulf Arabs and others agree with Israel on Iran and ISIS and other things, they'll come together and bring the Palestinians to the table. I think it is accurate to say there is a new sort of strategic alignment between Israel and those uh, Arab states on certain on, between Israel and some Arab states on certain questions like Iran. But getting from there to getting those Arab states to bring the Palestinians to the table to accept a deal that they are not willing to accept is something I don't think we should bank on as our approach to Middle East peace. Um, thank you. Can you all, all catch every word, Phil, as, as he's turning? Are you all hearing everything? No. Okay, you may want to turn your mic, Phil. Have it facing t like that, so it's off pointing the rear of it. Yeah, turn it like that. Okay, because um, as you turn toward us, you're going off mic. Um, I bet you want to jump in, John, but Nancy, I want to throw this kind of broader Middle East question to you. Whether it's looking at what's going on between Israelis and Palestinians and whether there is some deal there, um, or more broadly just at the region, you know, one, of the, one of the criticisms that has been leveled at the Trump administration is he comes to this with no experience. Jared Kushner comes to this with even less experience. Most of the people working on this for him come to this with little experience. Um, that's a valid criticism. On the other hand, 
if you have little experience, you bring little baggage. Or do you see opportunities for progress that maybe weren't possible under past administrations? Well, I'm an incurable optimist, so I would never say it, it's not worth trying. And sometimes fresh eyes can be helpful. At the same time, I agree with Phil that there's nothing new under the sun here. Um, the additional challenges, I would add to Phil's list, that we're seeing on the ground um, a level of division within Israeli societies and within Palestinian societies that add to the challenge and complexities of selling a deal. Um, and one of the, the, the necessary moves right now is to create means for there to be greater cohesion just within each of those, the Palestinians and the Israelis. Um, you know, one of the challenges also is getting all the pieces, all the, all the approaches to sync up. So the outside in, the bottom up, the top down, each of those have been lined up and ready to, to, to have success in the past, but the, the challenge is getting them all to be lined up at the same time. Um, I would also note that I think many of us have observed that this issue, I mean, we used to quaintly think of Middle East peace as this issue. We've just done a laydown that makes this a sideshow in a region that's on fire. And so the degree to which it continues to get attention and focus, you know, it could be an opportunity because you've got a different uh, set of, of um, concerns with the Arab neighbors, um, or it could mean that it just is something that can continue to be slowly simmering over there. Nonetheless, I, I would, you know, I think it's always worth the try we need to consider how we can be an honest broker. Because if we're not an honest broker, bringing that to the table, there's little hope of, getting, of having the, the forward momentum that we seek. You raise a bunch of things I would love to follow up on. One of them is this, this notion that Middle East peace process is a sideshow in the region, which is something you just would never have imagined saying 10 years ago. But let me put a question to you, John, that I was raising on the way in, which is, does the rise of Iran as maybe the more pressing uh, security concern for many parties in the region, if you were an optimist, does that open some doors toward, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend and open some paths to opportunity that weren't there a generation ago? Uh, I, I think it could, uh, Mary Louise. My, as I said a little while ago, my experience is that the enemy of my enemy is my enemy. Uh, and and if you if you you got to be very careful uh, about uh, assuming any friendship uh, in that particular region. Uh, I just make a couple of broad comments, and that is, uh, if this administration is not willing to say unambiguously that it will support a two-state outcome, uh, then I think we we leave the out the, the process of Middle East peace and Israel uh, Palestinian talks etc. in doubt. We have to say that. Uh, and I believe that's the only way. I, it's Still the only way. Look, if it's a binational true. outcome, look, I, I, was, I was in Israel the day after the president's inaugural speech for a conference. And the sense uh, by segments of the Israeli body politic that they were now unleashed to pursue a binational approach. We were in speeches the very next day, we were hearing the Palestinian Authority being called the Palestinian Autonomy meaning they were going to ultimately become a part of, of greater uh, Israel in that context. And, and I think, I just believe, because I've been doing this for a while and I, it's the most important thing I ever did was the Middle East peace. Uh, it is a cul-de-sac for Israel. It, it ultimately is a, creates uh, an issue of Israel's strategic viability as a state. The whole Zionist experience of a Jewish democracy is at risk uh, in a binational uh, arrangement. So this administration's unwillingness to unambiguously commit to a two-state outcome, I think, undercuts uh, what Jared Kushner is seeking to do already. Now, to their credit, they have gone on the listening tour and they've been listening, and I don't know what's going to come off the yellow sheet of paper with, with respect to principles. Phil's point is very good, and that is there, there are very few principles uh, that are going to make sense uh, that, uh, that, that will not be aligned, uh, obviously, with a two-state outcome or a binational outcome. Uh, but look, we have several hundred Israeli commanders and security officials who absolutely are committed to a two-state outcome. Much of the IDF, uh, which has been involved in the occupation of the West Bank for many, many years, they're committed to a two-state outcome. We ought to be helping, and the Arab Peace Initiative, 
which is one of the, which is probably not well understood and it ought to be well understood by the American community, the Arab Peace Initiative, which talks about the formal recognition of Israel by scores of Arab or Muslim countries in the immediate aftermath of the conclusion of a peace agreement, uh, those are very, very powerful incentives ultimately for moving towards the two-state outcome, which is I think what most responsible th thinkers believe on this issue. So we, we, we as a nation, which will not dictate Middle East peace, but can certainly be the vanguard for and the guardian of the process, we need to be unambiguous on this point. And with respect to Iran, uh, you know, Iran can create the regional boogeyman, which, which can, which will facilitate all others pointing in the direction of Iran and saying we got to solve that first. I don't buy that for a second uh, because the, there is no bad time to be attempting Middle East peace. And if we can stabilize that particular portion of the, uh, of the region, we take away from Iran yet one more reason for its justification in supporting organizations like Hamas and others. And having been personally involved with the Palestinians in this process, I will tell you, I believed in them, I believed in what they were seeking to do as partners with Israel, and their point was, we want Palestine, the, the emergent sovereign state of this process, we want Palestine to be uh, a platform for stability in the region, not a platform for instability, and we can set the example in this regard, and we want to be a partner with Israel in that process. There is no bad time to be doing this, and, and it, Iran as a regional boogeyman is not the justification for us not doing it. I'm not bowled over yet by y'all's optimism about the ultimate deal, Juan, what do you think? I'm probably least expert on this panel to talk about Middle East peace, but I do think it's interesting, just as a, an outside observer, how the lexicon itself has shifted, right? We talk about Middle East peace amid all of the dislocations and civil war and tumult that we're, we're talking about. It's almost a misnomer at this point, um, and it reflects your point about how the shift of centrality of this issue um, has really moved, um, Nancy, to your point. Um, and it does, does make me wonder, and this, this was a question during the Obama administration and now during the Trump administration, whether or not so centrally focusing on the resolution of Israeli-Palestinian peace and the two-state solution um, distracts from these broader dynamics um, and we're placing perhaps too much hope, given the, the diplomatic history of this and, and our sort of our, our framing of this issue, too much hope that forcing some sort of resolution, given uh, endogenous or exogenous factors, is in some way going to magically solve the other issues in the region that, that, uh, that so bedevil us. I, I'm not suggesting that people talk that way or think that way, but there's something embedded in the way that we've dealt with the Middle East peace process that assumes that that is the case, that there will be a, a broader set of resolutions that flow from it. And I think we're in a, in a situation now that's far more complex and far more advanced. And so it doesn't mean that we don't try to solve the problem, and it doesn't mean that it's any less important for the Palestinians on the ground or for the Israelis or for long-term uh, sort of resolution of Arab-Israeli uh, issues. But it it does suggest that we've got to maybe even talk about this differently. And the, the very notion of the Middle East peace process in the context of everything else we're talking about is, is I think, almost a misnomer at this point. Let me pivot us to focus on Iran. And I'm going to let you each give me a one word, yes or no. Will the nuclear deal survive? One. Yes, but. Welcome <laughs> back to you, Nancy. Yeah. I wish I had a crystal ball. I, I'm going to go with one on the yes, but. <laughs> yes, but. Yes, but. No. I guess. All right, you get to more things. Just keep going. Why? Um, to be honest, I uh, became more pessim pessimistic about that prospect a month ago with the president's decertification announcement, but kind of for the opposite reasons that were were pitched at the time, which is to say, until then, I had been arguing and could still argue now that notwithstanding the president having said this was the worst deal in history and he was going to make a top priority of dis dismantling it, notwithstanding all of that, for the nine months or whatever it is of his presidency, he has had multiple opportunities to get out of that deal, either by not waiving the sanctions or decertifying or just announce, I'm sorry, uh, you can remind me. It so we can hear it. Once a radio producer. Yeah, no, exactly, good. 
Uh, so he has had multiple, multiple occasions to get out of it and has somehow found a way not to because ultimately he or at least the people around him, yeah, that is working much better, um, uh, realize, I think, that they don't have an alternative to it and it would be not in our uh, strategic interest to do it. But make no mistake, the decertification announcement, while in and of itself had no necessary impact because Congress doesn't have to do anything. It looks like Congress isn't going to do anything. It has set us up for a very tricky situation going forward because the president, when he decertified, which is telling Congress that he didn't believe the sanctions were proportionate to what we were getting in return, uh, he gave Congress 60 days to kill the deal with expedited procedures to pass sanctions. Doesn't look like they'll do that. He invited Congress, working with our allies, to quote unquote, fix the fundamental flaws of the deal. But then he said, if Congress and our allies don't fix these fundamental flaws, and he enumerated them, sunset clauses, ballistic missiles, access to military bases, then it will be terminated. Well, guess what? Congress and our allies are not going to fundamentally change the deal. It was always clear the allies, who all believe it is working, as do most countries around the world, and the IEA, and most experts, uh, uh, cannot unilaterally change uh, a deal that was meticulously negotiated over two years by uh, uh, six countries endorsed by the Security Council and so on. So that's not going to happen, and it's now pretty clear that it's not going to happen. So the question now is, because it doesn't look like Congress will do anything, the next time the president has to waive the sanctions to keep the deal alive, which is on January 15th, what's he going to do? Uh, the only thing I think in favor, and that's why I said I guess, or I agreed with colleagues saying yes but, is one, that he's always found a way before to find a way to not blow this up because I don't think they have a, a, a suitable response if we do blow it up and Iran resumes its nuclear program. And two, we've seen this president before make uh, uh, far-reaching pronouncements and then somehow explain himself away for for... Uh, changing his mind even with not much to show for it. And so that is possible on January 15th. He somehow declares success, but he really has set up a perilous situation in which uh, he may feel obliged to not waive sanctions and then, uh, uh, and then the deal dies. While you've got the mic, Phil, one thing I wanted to follow up on is something you wrote recently about Iran and the politicization of intelligence as you saw it. You wrote that for anybody who followed what happened in the run-up to war in Iraq, there's a familiar pattern going on here with, you argued, the White House making false claims about weapons of mass destruction. Explain what you're seeing and what actual evidence you have that intelligence is being politicized in some way. Uh, it's an important question. Uh, I wrote that after the president's decertification speech because it did feel to me like a familiar pattern uh, of an administration uh, getting so focused on achieving its goals that it sees everything through a certain prism and sells everything through a certain prism. And when you listen to that speech with the long detail of all sorts of dangerous and nefarious Iranian activities, which is, is legit, um, uh, the implication that somehow if we had just held on to sanctions a little bit more, they would have thrown in the towel and uh, given in. Um, the message seemed to be that we, the American public was being prepared for, if necessary, war, and being persuaded that that uh, uh, is something that would be necessary because of the, the, the gravity of the threat that we faced. And what I just tr tried to remind people, what's similar to uh, the Iraq war was not only that you know, itemization of the threat and the amping it up that we need to deal with, but the risk that if the threats don't work, then you actually have to go and do the military operation. So that's what I'm worried about uh, in this situation. When you've gotten to the point which you're implying that it is unacceptable for Iran to have a nuclear program, um, and we're going to get them to gi give, up, give it up entirely by threatening certain actions, if they don't, then you've put yourself in a situation where either you have to back down from those threats that you've made, or you have to uh, implement that action. 
And so I'm not, there's a whole debate about you know, accusing opponents of the Iran deal of wanting war. And I want to be clear, that's not what I'm saying. But I, I do want to be clear that you can't, you can't have it both ways. If you're going to say, this deal is bad and I'm going to insist on a better deal, and if I don't get that better deal, then I'll do what is necessary. You can't both do that and then say, oh, but don't, don't suggest that I'm not hinting that somehow military force uh, is an option here. I'll introduce just as a counter voice who's not here, but I uh, a couple of weeks ago interviewed Norman Rule, who was the DNI's Iran mission manager. He retired last month. He did Iran for the CIA for 30 years, and I asked him about these points, and he said he saw no uh, echoes of Iraq, no politicization of the intelligence on Iran, and we pressed him on that, and there's a conversation you can go listen to on the NPR website if you want. But to introduce another perspective, Juan, do you want to jump in as the somebody who served on the Bush NSC? Yeah. I know Iran wasn't your portfolio, but you were in yeah. the White House. Um, what, what's your... Take? Yeah, I, I, I was in the White House the second term, so I wasn't part of the debates internally on Iraq, but certainly saw it and was uh, privy to, to watching General Allen and his great work. Um, I, have, I have a different point of view than Phil, but let me go back to your, your broader question about, about the deal itself, because I, th I think- The yes but. The yes but, because the, 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 the yes is that I think there's a recognition that the deal gets us something, right? It gets us some degree of assurances. But I think to Phil's point about the idea of fixing the deal, um, I think that's more than just sort of political theater. I think. I think there's merit in that. This is a 10 to 15 year deal. And any sense that a deal like that is going to remain static over that period of time, uh, looking at the history of arms and missile deals uh, that we've had, whether it's in the context of US-Soviet deals or, or others, there's always been amendments and fixes and modernization of deals. Um, and so in that context, there's, there's no reason that you shouldn't have a, a process by which you think about how you, you improve a deal especially if there's a sense that Iran is taking advantage or cheating, et cetera. So I think there's, the idea of fixing shouldn't be dismissed outright. Now, whether or not we're prepared to do the, the hard diplomacy that's part of it, I think that's a big question, and I think something the administration needs to answer for. Secondly, I think there's, there are a, 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 a bounty of ways that you can pressure the Iranians in the context of the current deal, which I think we haven't really done completely, and certainly outside the deal. And so keep in mind that when the JCPOA was, was negotiated, the Obama administration committed to, and I think the Trump administration has continued this, to say we are going to maintain our economic and financial tools and measures, largely sanctions, around the issues that are not nuclear related. Now I testified many times before the Senate when the JCPOA was being debated that there is inherent tension in that deal. Uh, frankly, purposeful diplomatic ambiguity, I would say, um, when you're arguing for a deal that would promise to the Iranians reintegration into the international financial and commercial system, while also reserving to the US all of the major powers and tools to unplug them from that system because of their support to terrorism, their support to Assad, their human rights abuses, their missile program, all of which are still in place. So there's an inherent tension in that, but it also then is an opportunity for those like the Trump administration who would say, we need to be more forceful, more confrontational with an Iran that is more adventurous after the JCPOA itself. So you can, you can do that. Final point, others still want the deal. And so the Europeans want the deal, the Iranians themselves seem to want the deal because I think it's an advantageous deal to them. And so I think that that is, that's the reason why the deal will survive, because there's ways of both fixing, pressuring, and maintaining the deal in a way that meets the interests that we're talking about. And I think that's where we're headed with the Trump administration. I, in a moment, am gonna jump us to Syria and then on to your questions, but John, Nancy, do either of you want a quick last word on Iran? Yeah, very quickly, three, uh, three quick points. Uh, having quick. had uh, a bit of experience on the military option, it's like North Korea. We've got options. We probably don't want to exercise unless we absolutely have to, which is a national emergency. We ain't anywhere near that, number one. Number two, on any agreement where we can get the EU, Germany, the P5, to include, obviously, Russia, China, and the United States, any occasion where we can get agreement on that, we've got to be very careful about throwing it out the window over questionable certification issues. And number three, if we're going to make America great again, uh, and we're going to put America first, 
uh, we have to understand that should we have to snap sanctions back on, there are a couple of American companies that are looking at $100 billion deals which could employ 100,000 Americans conceivably that will go out the window in the event that that happens. So we, we, I think to Phil's point and to Juan's point, the Congress is going to ultimately be the break on this issue for us. I would add here. Quick, my yes but was the importance of not conflating the many Iran-related issues that everybody has already discussed with specifically the nuclear issue. And the deal was always designed to address in a narrow way the nuclear issue. It doesn't address this large landscape of other threats, concerns, challenges. And uh, uh, you know, getting a handle on how we deal with that will be important. And I think it will uh, create additional incentive to stay with the deal so that doesn't come back on the table as well. Can I just add one thought? Please. Uh, I am in no way saying, you know, this deal is perfect and it doesn't leave concerns. There are all sorts of concerns. No deal that you negotiate with a tough adversary is. But we are kidding ourselves if we think it can be, quote, unquote, fixed by changing fundamental aspects of the deal. If you want to talk about how we can handle ballistic missiles outside the deal or some of Iran's regional activities, there are things we can do. But my worry, to go back to the original point, is if the president is implying we need to change these fundamental aspects, get rid of sunset clauses, uh, stop them from developing ballistic missiles, allow us to go to their military sites whenever we feel like it rather than using the procedures. That is what I am concerned about. If you're being told that that needs to be fixed or we walk away, uh, then we're going to end up having to walk away. Uh, and if we have to walk away, that's when we, we have to start scrubbing the military plans again um, as they uh, resume their activities. And then uh, the final point, sorry, on the politicization of intelligence or whatever. The president also in his decertification speech uh, essentially accused Iran of violating the deal. And then he picked examples that actually show why the deal is working, exceeding the heavy water cap. Again, if you're not following it closely, it sounds like he's whipping up the public to say that they're cheating. They slightly exceeded the heavy water cap for a short amount of time. The IAEA challenged them on it, and then he put it back in place. And then he gave another example about doing testing not in line with our expectations. If you're not following the technical details, you start nodding your head, and you're thinking, they're cheating, they're taking over the region, and we, they must be stopped. Be careful and focus on the details, and it turns out the deal is actually working. And let, me, let me just jump in very quickly. In defense of the Bush administration, um, I would commend folks to read the Silverman Rob Commission, which looked at whether or not there was a politicization of the intelligence, and they concluded there was not. Judge Silverman's op ed in the Wall Street Journal attacking that underlying myth that has sort of, sort of pervaded that that was the case. Uh, there was an intelligence view from the late 90s about the WMD program in Iraq. We can debate till. The cows come home about how that intelligence was used, the assumptions, the refraction to Phil's point. But I just want to I want to point that out. Let's let's be sure about how we're comparing and um, and talking about policy decisions. Thank you. I will inject one more fact into the mix, which is for those of us keeping track, the IAEA this week reaffirmed in its quarterly report that Iran is complying with the deal. So that is the view of the international community. Let me shift us to Syria. Of the gazillion questions I could ask, and we could be here all day, let me throw a provocative one into the mix, which is this. Is the real victor to emerge from Syria's civil war Vladimir Putin? That is a question that Mike Sulik raised. He was the CIA's uh, head of the clandestine service for years, and he argues Putin got what he came for in Syria and in the region. He's raised Russia's profile in the region. He has kept... Assad in power, helped keep Assad in power. He's taken credit for the defeat of ISIS. Uh, John, what do you think? I, I agreed specifically with your, uh, with your formulation, but he has certainly emerged uh, in, a, in a stronger place than he was before. Uh, and as, as they were uh, intervening uh, in that conflict, the Russians, I was making one of my rounds through the Middle East in my previous job, uh, and I found that not just were they intervening to stabilize the Assad regime, and by the way, not helping us really at all with regard to the Islamic State, but I, as, I, as I was visiting the leadership in the region, there was either a Russian delegation coming out of the office or going into the office behind me. And so what the, what the 
uh, the, what Putin was attempting to do um, by virtue of the perception that the previous administration was in fact uh, moving out of the region, not retreating, I don't want to use that word, but moving out of the region was they were going to use this as an opportunity to establish Russian relationships uh, in the vacuum of the departure of the, of the American regime that were going to be uniquely available to them in history. Now, they've had the, the difficulty, of course, of coming down on the side of the Shia elements, which is going to be something to haunt them for some period of time. But look, the, the, the Russians have a unique capacity to dig in behind a difficult policy and endure enormous uh, uh, ad, ad, adversity as a direct result of their, of their uh, involvement. But I think, in the end, uh, Putin is in a stronger position uh, internationally than before. There's going to be huge economic consequences for his long-term presence there. But the other piece of this, and it was also missed, uh, was this was another opportunity for the Russians to um, showcase a, a modernized military that we had not seen before. The capacity for them to deploy at a strategic distance. And if you noticed, they have employed virtually all of their strategic systems, blackjack bombers, submarine launch cruise missiles, vertical launch systems, etc. Not only have they stabilized the situation in Syria, but Vladimir Putin has actually exercised many of his firepower options we would never have seen otherwise. And that's often missed in this conversation. So I think he's, out, he's up on top right now as a result. I would add that I think um, yeah, uh, on top of all of that, I actually think Iran will be the real winner. And I want to mention that in the context of Iraq, which remarkably we haven't spoken about yet, and the area where we still have significant troop presence. Um, and Iraq is entering um, a very critical six-month period as it looks to May 18 elections. Parliamentary, it will reshuffle potentially or affirm prime minister, president, governors, the whole, go the whole government structure has the chance of moving forward. And it's at a time where you've just liberated huge swaths of territory from ISIS but the, but the, the PMU, the Iranian-backed popular military units, are increasingly providing security in many of these cleared areas. Uh, they've gone in, even in the Sunni areas, they're having um, relative acceptance right now because of the thirst for security at the community level. And you've got those same uh, uh, Iran-backed Shia militia units, the PMUs, controlling the border into Syria. And, with you, and you've got uh, presence in Syria, and then you've got the Hezbollah in Lebanon. And I, going back to your very original question, it's that potential swath of Iranian influence that's probably rattling the Saudis. And we're poised at a moment right now um, in Iraq, I would argue, that there, there's a, a critical need to double down on enabling the next six months to result in a country that ha does not resort yet again to factionalism, particularly between Shia and Sunnis, in a way that 2014 did last time they had elections that led to the rise of ISIS. So we're in a critical period in Iraq that will have uh, in, influence and, and uh, implications for what goes on in Syria and for the role of Iran, which is poised to have a significant swath of influence in the region. Uh, Nancy deserves some real credit on this. USIP has done work on the ground in Iraq for the stabilization of some very, very difficult places that I'm not sure we've seen anyone else able to accomplish. And USIP deserves a lot of credit for that. I would add that if we don't create reconciliation between the Sunni and Shia communities in critical parts of Iraq, that those divisions will be exploited by the PMUs, by the Shia Iran-backed militia. So we really need to double down now on a time where Iraq is already not at the top of the list, as we've just experienced with this, with this discussion thus far. Um, I'm going to let Phil and Juan get in a quick word on Syria before I open it to questions. But that's your signal. We're going to get to questions in a minute or two. We have mics on this side of the room. This side of the room, we will have time for a few. So if you have one, you can start making your way, and I'll open it to the floor in a minute. Um, Phil and Juan, same question. What's your quick take from each of you? What is the U.S. goal in Syria? 
now. I mean, it was framed around defeating ISIS, and ISIS, with the fall of Raqqa, is on its heels, at least in terms of you know, territory that it controls. So what's, what's the U.S. looking to do in Syria? I think the U.S. goal is changing. It started uh, with a goal of a political transition, getting beyond Assad, finding some sort of uh, moderate consensus government. But that project and goal has been thwarted by a number of things, including the Russian one that you initially asked about, because I, one of the reasons the United States failed in achieving that goal, uh, you know, there are a range of reasons for it, but one was the absolute determination not just of the Syrian regime, but by its backers in Iran and Russia, who were strongly committed to thwarting our achievement of that goal, uh, and they managed to do so. And I think Russia's goal was to prevent regime change just as a matter of principle, to prevent what they saw as extremists taking over, and frankly, to prevent the United States from advancing its agenda and, and influence in the region. So I think over time, the US goal pivoted from that uh, desired political transition especially once it got to the point that the costs of achieving it were higher than I think most people assessed, um, and that the costs of failing to achieve it were building enormously with, with, with uh, casualties, refugees, extremism, diplomatic tensions in the region. And so it then pivoted to dealing with ISIS, which was a hugely important goal, but a lesser goal, and now I think it is, I mean, it depends if you're talking about the administration or what U.S. interests should be, but it is essentially now focused on winding down the conflict, which is falling very much short of the goal of a political transition and getting rid of Assad, which is, is a bitter pill to swallow, which follows very much short of denying Iran and Russia excessive influence, which is a bitter pill to swallow. But it's better than an ongoing seven-year civil war killing you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Killing another seven years. Why? Mayor Louise, I, I think that's right. I think a really fundamental and important question for the administration, uh, assuming the defeat of ISIS and the lack of a reemergence of a global Salafi jihadi safe haven out of uh, Syria, which is important, um, is what is our Iran Hezbollah policy in the context of Syria? And to Phil's point, I think the wind down of the conflict and some sort of political transition are the long term goals. I think the next near-term question is, what's our posture vis-a-vis -vis our allies on the ground? What's our posture vis-a-vis -vis what is uh, already happening, which is a Syrian-Iranian Hezbollah attempt to recapture territory to create a cohesive uh, zone, not just of governance, but of potential influences in terms of a Shia crescent that Iran can then have access to. And so I think we're now shifting to a moment where the administration is going to have to determine what is our Syria policy in light of our Iran policy. And I don't think we've quite heard the answer to that yet. And, and to your question on Russia, I think um, the, the problem, because I think Russia is empowered by this, despite all the costs that General Allen has talked about, uh, because all roads have led to, to Moscow on this question, right? Whether it was Secretary Kerry or even in the context of current questions of what happens next, Moscow has put itself at the center of the discussion, which is led others to come to Moscow, whether it's Israeli leadership, we've seen many more visits and, and, um, and um, relationships sort of emerge, uh, whether it's military deals coming out of the Gulf, Moscow has put itself at the center. And remarkably, um, despite what some of us had, had, had thought would happen, they have not borne the immediate costs of the adventure, right? There hasn't been the internal turmoil in Russia, no protests and problems of Russian adventurism in, in the Middle East. Uh, there hasn't been some sort of economic uh, crisis as a result. There hasn't been a backlash of greater terrorist activity against Russia because they're now central to it. There hasn't been really any cost to the enormous human rights violations uh, that they've been a part of. Um, and frankly, they've been rewarded in some ways. They were the savior of the, of the chemical weapons red line, right, uh, in many ways. And so it's been a remarkable set of steps that the Russians have taken, which have had short-term value. There are long-term costs and questions, the relationship with Iran, long-term presence in the region, but they have come out a winner in this. There's no question, and it's part of, the, of Putin's broader design. Final point, just real quickly, because I think it's important conceptually. Uh, the Russians and the Iranians have echoed back to the US and to the West a theme that there is no military solution to this problem to Phil's point about where we want to go politically. 
And ultimately that's right. That feeds right into our sensibilities. But they feed us that as a sword and a shield to what their policies are, which are to use massive amounts of military force to achieve political and diplomatic gain, which is exactly what's happened in Syria. So I just wanted to point that out. And, and I will say, having spent some time in Russia and reporting on Russia in the past year, one of the reasons Putin hasn't paid a price for this is that if you are Russian and following you along, you wouldn't know, because among other things he controls, he controls the media. They also, have, just one quick thing, they also, I agree with everything Juan said, I would just even add, they also haven't paid a price in terms of their relations with the Sunni Arab leaders in states, which, you know, one might have thought that uh, joining with Iran and backing Hezbollah and Assad would have, we may say something about the cynicism of the region, but even that, uh, far from alienating them, they seem to... Turkey. 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 Yeah. We have time for a few questions from the floor. If you have one, make your way to the mic. Um, we're going to start on this side of the room. If you would please state your name, uh, affiliation if you want to give one, keep your question short in the interest of getting to as many as we can, and please keep it a question. Great. Uh, we're Going to the mic right back here. Great yes, panel. Uh, thank you very much. This is Doug Brooks with the International Stability Operations Association, uh, the contractors that support stability operations. My question is on the future of Kurdistan. Uh, the Kurds took a big gamble and seem to have lost, and I'd just be curious. They're one of our strongest allies, obviously, in the, in the region. Future of Kurdistan. Who wants to jump in? You've stumped our expert panel. I'll just say very briefly that, you know, they've signaled uh, that they'll accept uh, the, the, the ruling on what happens with the referendum. And, you know, whatever you may think about the, the merit of the referendum, it does move us past the more immediate splintering of the region. And, you know, the hopeful uh, interpretation is that it will give uh, Kurdistan itself an opportunity to heal the divisions that opened up over the last year between the, the two parties. It, it obviously was the, re, the part of Iraq that was the most prosperous. The Pesh were incredibly courageous during this fight. Iraq needs uh, Kurdistan, uh, uh, probably more than Kurdistan needs the rest of Iraq. Uh, but we are at a moment right now where there's the potential for moving towards the May elections on a basis of, of unity based on what the Kurdish leadership has just signaled. Thank you. Yes, sir. I don't think this is on. Oh, yeah, it's on. My name is Blake Selzer. Um, I spent the last three years in, uh, based out of Jordan for an international humanitarian organization working on Syria relief. My question is expanding on what Mary Louise Kelly said, what's the U.S.'s goal in Syria now? I wanted to see if the panel had thoughts on the U.S.'s role within the U.N. Um, system. You have Security Council resolutions calling for diplomatic discussions, but it, you also have the Astana talks. It was mentioned by a panelist that Russia and Iran have taken more leadership in this, of course, with Turkey. And Turkey's the other angle I wanted to ask your opinion on. So do you see the U.S. playing a bigger role in the U.N. side of things moving forward? And finally, not to forget that there's still communities under siege in Syria and how we should continue to be addressing those issues. It's not over. And I think you're seeing less and less attention on the humanitarian side of things. Thanks. Okay, so several questions there. The UN role in Syria and the ongoing fighting in Syria. Uh, Phil, you want to tackle that? Sure. Um, well, I think Juan addressed the key outstanding policy issue at this point, which is with ISIS's defeat and the vacuum potentially created by it, what is the US stance on who fills those areas? Because as I said in my earlier remarks, I think we've already pretty much moved on from the goal of a political transition as desirable as that would be. And that's kind of my response to Astana. Sure, you know, let's push ahead with political talks, but honestly, there's very little prospect for a near-term political transition, and the more urgent priorities are, are de-escalating the conflict and finishing off ISIS. But that leaves this major question, because to defeat ISIS in southeastern Syria, we had to turn to uh, coalition partners that aren't necessarily uh, uh, going to remain in charge in terms of long-term governance. And as the regime backed by Iran and Russia tries to fill the vacuum created by ISIS's displacement, how much do we care about stopping that Iranian-Syrian uh, regime uh, filling of that 
uh, gap. And it's a, it's a particularly thorny question because we have a strong interest in denying Iran and Hezbollah a role in that area. And uh, we're certainly hearing from Israelis and Saudis and others about that. On the other hand, uh, we shouldn't pretend that there's some easy, cost-free way of doing that, um, as we discovered throughout the entire Syrian war. And so if we do commit to that goal, including with American personnel on the ground, we need to be prepared to uh, back them and to deal with the other repercussions which could come elsewhere in the region, including in Iraq. analyst and a former diplomat. Um, failing a two-state solution, uh, the unitary entity which exists is Muslim majority by about 2050, a generation and a half or so. Um, that is certainly an existential threat to Israel. It may be the existential threat to Israel. Why doesn't Israel recognize that? Um, let me offer a couple of views. We, we use the term Middle East peace process, and one, uh, I think, properly uh, challenged that term. More and more, we should be using Israeli-Palestinian peace process. That, that's the accurate term. Um, you know, there's a whole variety of reasons, but if you look at the, the current politics in Israel and the, the right-wing coalition uh, that serves the uh, prime minister, uh, the interests associated with the evacuating the West Bank so with the, the huge numbers of settlers that are out of the generally the four settlement blocks uh, will create a trauma for Israel we can't even begin to imagine. And I think if you go back to the, uh, the Israeli uh, retrograde out of Gaza and we remember the trauma that Israel went through as they were forcibly removing Israeli settlers, that was a relatively small number. We're, we're talking potentially outside the four settlement blocks, which are generally considered to be what will be swapped for equivalent space inside Green Line Israel, we're talking probably, conservatively, 100,000 Israeli citizens. And the Palestinians have been pretty clear. They're not interested in, in drawing any other lines for Israeli settlers on, in Palestine. They're also not interested in extending Palestinian citizenship to Israelis who would want to stay in Palestine. So just that one issue alone, the settlement politics, make it very difficult ultimately for uh, this sense that the two-state outcome is the only uh, process that can go forward. As you properly uh, have, I think, identified, uh, you know, the single state option where we find a, a disenfranchised Arab population that don't participate in the democratic processes is in fact a great strategic vulnerability for Israel. And it's going to have to come to grips with this. Over to this side. Yes, sir. Good morning. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, my name is Stephen Howard, and I'm with In Defense of Christians. And one question I had was just on U.S. policy in Lebanon. This is a country that's already gone through immense demographic challenges with the Syrian refugee crisis. And given just these last 10 or so days, what do you think the U.S. can do to help stabilize this country to ensure that yet another state in the Middle East doesn't destabilize? Thank you. What can the U.S. do? What should the U.S. do? What's the U.S. responsibility for what's happening in Lebanon? Well, I mean, maybe I can weigh in here. It's, it's complicated, and again, I don't pretend to be the, the deepest expert on Lebanon, but I think first and foremost, uh, we have an interest in stability in Lebanon, obviously, and so trying to weigh in in terms of what happens next politically is important. I know our ambassador on the ground and embassy try to do that. I think there's a broader question of um, how do we see the future of Lebanon and whether or not um, we see it in the stark terms that the Saudis do at this point, right? Whether or not it has fallen into the hands of Iran and Hezbollah or whether or not there are ways of, of uh, stabilizing and helping uh, Lebanon and helping in a variety of ways. The refugee crisis is huge. I think most people don't recognize the, the, the huge percentage of refugees that the Lebanese have taken per capita, just enormous. It's a, it, I think if we were to equate it to what the U.S. would take, it's probably close to 100 million, if not more, uh, people into the population of the U.S. So imagine that, right? And probably even higher. Um, so that's one thing. I think helping with respect to that. Secondly, helping economically. I think there's a, there's a big question as to how to maintain the stability of the banking sector, something that we work on from my firm uh, with Lebanese clients, 
and others. And so how can we help stabilize the economy? Because that's critical to, uh, to the livelihood of the state. And finally, just helping figure out how to, how to work with the Saudis and our allies to influence positively. Because I'm not quite sure what the end state here is if the assumption is that the Lebanese state and the Lebanese armed forces have fallen into the hands of Iran and Hezbollah. Are we talking about war? Uh, because if we're talking about war, that's incredibly uh, disruptive, messy, um, and hard to imagine at this point, and hard to imagine what comes next. And so um, I think the US has a role to play in all of it. And I, if I can just, hearkening back to a couple of the questions, I think there's a fundamental question here about what's the US role in the region writ large? Uh, what's US power? What, what, what do we do in terms of Syria and the populations that are still at risk and the vacuums that are being formed? What do we do with our Kurdish friends and allies? I think the US has to answer those questions. And even if we have to be tactical about it, we have to make sure that our friends and allies realize that our relationship with the US isn't just about uh, near-term US interests, which has often been the case and often been the way that our relationships have been perceived. One idea in the context of Kurdistan, and General Allen may disagree, is I think we should announce that we're going to form a permanent base in Erbil as a way of solidifying the sense of American presence in the region, um, calming the waters with respect to Kurdistan, signaling to Baghdad that we're going to be present in a way without rupturing uh, the Iraqi state. So I think there are things that we can do tactically that demonstrate the U.S. isn't absent from the region and can play a positive role. Raises really interesting questions that we've barely gotten to touch on about to what extent U.S. foreign and security policy should uh, be organized around human rights, should be organized around promoting and supporting democracy in this region and other regions of the world, which are themes I'm sure will continue throughout the day. I apologize in advance that we're not going to get to every question. What we're going to do is a, a lightning round now. I'm going to take one from this side, one from this side, and then you can ambush these guys at the coffee break with your further questions. So to you first, and then we'll get yours, and then we'll... Thank you very much. My name morning. is Samir Al-Taki. I'm a Syrian politician, mm -hmm. and I'm heading a center for strategic studies in Dubai. Uh, actually, I, I think there are some illusions in, in the debate here that... You think that still America do have leverage in the region? I doubt. Second, there hadn't been any study why ISIS returned to Mosul and what were the conditions that igni ignited this and why Bashar al-Assad would be better than Maliki again. So uh, uh, pretending that we are finishing with ISIS, I tell you it is an illusion and you don't have the leverage to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last question. Yes, I, my name is Munzer Sleiman. I'm the Washington Bureau Chief of Al Mayadeen TV. It's a pan-Arab television station based in Beirut, Lebanon. I'm trying in my question to reflect our audience question to this panel. Who runs foreign policy in the Middle East? U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. That's a question I always hear people asking. Is it from the White House? or the foggy bottom, and whether Secretary Tillerson will stay uh, after Thanksgiving or whatever. I mean, that's a question. <laughs> the, other, the other thing is the issue of proxy. Many people now think, because of if, if, if there is a legitimate question about who is running US foreign policy, then is also US is a proxy sometimes used or employed by regional powers that have economic or energy power that could influence the United States with this administration. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So just a couple of small, tidy questions that we can easily wrap up there. Uh, Nancy, does the US have leverage in the region? Yes, but. Yes, but. Um, I think we do, we do have leverage. Um, it, it's a different kind of leverage probably than we thought going into the Syria conflict uh, some years back. Um, but I would, let me link it to the other part of his question about the conditions for the emergence of ISIS. And where I think we can exert leverage is um, helping Iraq, for example, not revert to the conditions that enabled ISIS to emerge in 2014. And to my earlier comment, there is an opportunity in the next six months uh, to translate a certain sense of unity 
that prevailed in the fight against ISIS into the political space. And it will require, optimistically speaking, um, a more inclusive government where the spoils are shared among the Shia, the Sunni, and the Kurds. And on the Kurdistan issue, I would add to my earlier answer that I, I think we all need to guard against and help there not emerge a Kurdish-Arab divide in both Syria and Iraq, and to address um, the Shia-Sunni divides. And part of that is a function of governance. And about a year or plus ago, I was in Iraq at a time where there were a lot of demonstrations going on in cities throughout the country. They weren't demonstrating on the basis of communal uh, needs. You know, I'm Shia, I'm Sunni. They were demonstrating because they wanted better governance. And 14 years into this disruption of Iraq, there has been the growing emergence of civil society and uh, a younger generation that has a different vision for what they want their future to be. And we have the opportunity, we have the leverage to support that um, and help those voices emerge and help that unity prevail. I don't want to sound too Pollyannish, it's, you know, but it's, there is, a, the, the part of a good news is that that is a sentiment among a lot of the communities in these countries. And um, I would just add on, the, the best example of that, the most important bright spot to not lose sight of, of that example is in Tunisia. And we need to strongly support Tunisia, which remains as the only standing example of a post-dictatorship country not collapsing into chaos. And if you ask any Tunisian from President Esebzi to the four Nobel Prize winning civil society leaders to community members, the key ingredients were from, from the 50s, they invested in education and they invested in women's education. And so I just, I add that both because we've got to stay with Tunisia as an example for the region and it, and it speaks to the kind of leverage that we absolutely should not squander. Uh, Phil or John, one of you want to take on quickly the excellent question, who is running US foreign policy in the Middle East? Who's in charge? Neither of us. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think we can tell right now, to be quite honest with you. But. No, I agree. And I mean, I gave that one example of on the Iran issue, there seems to be a struggle. Uh, I mean, there are differences. There are clear differences. We saw it on Qatar, where the president tweeted his absolute support for Saudi Arabia, while the Defense Department was stressing military ties with Qatar, and the State Department was saying it didn't understand. So, you know, you have differences on that. Uh, the Iran nuclear deal, from what we do understand, the president wanted to do one thing, and he was persuaded by advisors. So, and by the way, you know, it's not unprecedented uh, the for this to, support. exactly. Yeah. Uh, right. So it is an open question. I'm gonna exercise moderator prerogative and close with one last question. Quick answer from each of you, because we have spent the last 90 minutes talking about problems and challenges and tumult. If you look at the region, what's a bright spot? What gives you hope? Phil. I mean, there are a couple of things. Um, name one. Name one. I only get one. one. This may surprise people to hear me say it, but I think the possibility of transformation in Saudi Arabia has an upside along with the risks that we've been talking about. Saudi Arabia needs to be transformed. Uh, it can't go on as it has been going on for economic, social, and other regions. And so the prospect of a young, ambitious, bold leader who's willing to say, we can't just do oil anymore, we have to transform the economy, we have to marginalize extremist clerics, we have to bring women into the workforce and education. Uh, I mean, I could take another 90 minutes and tell you all the risks involved in that and all of the regional problems and all the ways it might not work. But if you're looking for a path forward in a positive way, uh, maybe there's something in that one. John, what gives you hope? And I would expand just slightly on what Phil has said. And I, as I said, I've been out of the region a long time, and uh, in particular in the Gulf. Uh, there has been enormous change in the Gulf in the context of embracing uh, education, uh, in uh, uh, women's rights, uh, economic diversification, the embrace of modernity. I think those changes, when I look back upon my first experiences in the 70s in that region and where it is today. Um, 
yes, there are problems. Phil said we could go down a, a long, long list of the issues that we face. But when I think about where we have come and where I think we're poised to go, and this goes to the point of uh, American leadership in the region. There is a thirst for American leadership in the region. This is a real, real opportunity for the Trump administration, both to help solve some of the difficulties in the Gulf itself, to exert leadership in helping Israel ultimately to be secure and for the Palestinians to have a state, to deal with the succession issues around the region in terms of leadership. There's a real thirst, that's a bright spot for me, a, a thirst by the uh, elements within the region for American, uh, an American role, a reassertion of an American role. This is something that the Trump administration ought to be leveraging in every possible way. A comprehensive regional strategy within which we have the con context to deal with the individual problems would go a long way towards helping in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to, you mentioned Tunisia, which is clearly for you a bright spot. Uh, quickly, yes, Tunisia, and I would add to what I said earlier is the power-sharing government that they continue to maintain between the secularists and the Islamist parties, which is a model of how to be a more equitable uh, government. And the, the second bright spot, uh, which expands a little or builds a little bit on what Phil and, and uh, John said, and that is uh, the vibrancy of the many youth leaders I have met, both in terms of the entrepreneurial energy they're bringing, the insistence on a different kind of future, and they, you know, there's, there's an extraordinary young generation coming forward. I, I, I'm gonna ride that, that intellectual wake. I think it's absolutely right. You know, my, my experience from a commercial perspective, and certainly when I was in government, is that there's enormous hope and opportunity with the youth in the region. And in particular, what we, I think we've seen in, in the last couple of years is entrepreneurial uh, sort of spirits rising, and especially around new technology. Um, we've seen it certainly in the countering of violent extremism. You've seen uh, people taking ownership of that issue and, and being entrepreneurial about how to do it. We've seen it with the creation of new businesses. Um, and we've seen it with pockets of real innovation, not just in places like Dubai, but in, but in other parts of the Middle East. And so. Um, I think that's, a, that's an area of hope because one, one would, one would uh, hope to have a vision of a competition for that opportunity as opposed to a competition to fill uh, vacuums of crisis, right? And I think that's the hope for the region, that you do have a competition for opportunity as opposed to uh, ongoing conflict. Juan Zarate, Nancy Lindborg, John Allen, Philip Gordon, thanks to you all. Thanks to you all. Good morning. <laughs>